we'll begin the event with the four of us on the panel, which is myself, Roddy, Lena, and Monica. I'll do four more introductions in a moment. We're each going to speak for five minutes. While we are doing so, I would encourage you all to put any comments or questions onto the chat function, which you'll find at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And then I, as chair, will gather those questions together and then share them, read them out. Um, so do say who you are on the on the chat when you make your question. And we'll do a round of questions and I'll ask the panelists to respond and then we'll do another round and so on. So it's, you know, it's not the same as all being in the room together. Um, but here we are, it's 2021, this is where we are, this is the way we have to do it. And hopefully having the event and having this opportunity for dialogue and sharing will be a useful one when we share the recording afterwards. Before we start with the introductions then and then with the presentations, I suggest that we share a minute silence in memory of the people who have lost their lives in Colombia over the last two weeks since the national strike began. So if that's okay with you, we'll join together in a virtual um, circle of memory. Thank you all very much for observing that so impeccably, even though I know that I've forcibly muted your microphones. So, um, the introductions. I'm Matthew Brown, I'm Professor of Latin American History here at the University of Bristol. I'm the author of a couple of books, including The Struggle for Power in Post-Independence, Colombia and Venezuela and I run a project with a bunch of colleagues at the National University of Colombia um, called Bringing Memories In From the Margins, Transitional Justice and Creative Methodologies for Reconciliation. I'm gonna say something first about the historical context for the event. Then I'm gonna pass over to Dr. Roddy Brett, who's a senior lecturer in the School of Politics, Sociology and International Studies here at the University of Bristol and author of a forthcoming book, forthcoming, I think, Roddy, if not finished, uh, The Role of Victims and Perpetrators in Peacemaking in Colombia. Then Roddy will hand over to Lena Malagon. Lena is Research Associate in the School of Law at Ulster University. Her PhD is from St Andrews in 2019, she's a human rights lawyer and is physically in Bristol and so therefore is part of our wider family of colleagues on these subjects. And then finally, we'll travel to Bogota, where we're joined by Dr. Monica Amador Jimenez, who is research associate in the School of Geographical Sciences at the University of Bristol, and the researcher on the bioresilience project. Her PhD is from the University of Oslo and also, like Roddy and Lena, has extensive experience of peacemaking in Colombia. So, without further ado, we'll crack on. Here's the historical context for what is happening in, in Colombia at the present. I'll be very happy to be critiqued for my interpretation when we come round to the questions and to take comments and, and interpretations. I've done the kind of classic historians thing of dividing into the short term, the medium term and the longer term causes. I'm sure much of this will be familiar to most of you from the media coverage and so on, but I thought it would be quite useful to just chunk it together in this format. So of course the short term causes of 
the national strike and the protests and the violence which has accompanied them was a tax reform proposal from the government which was ditched after a week of the protest the finance minister was also replaced there were many um protests and rebellions in colombians colombia's history caused by tax reform most famously that of the comuneros at the end of their 18th century which is perceived as being one of the causes of the independence of what is now colombia from colonial rule the Comuneros rebellion at the end of the 18th century was diffused by negotiations between the Viceroy and the Archbishop of Bogota at the time. And one of the reasons why today's protests have continued beyond two weeks is, of course, because of the police brutality, the murders and the disappearances which characterise the first few days of the events murders, disappearances, use of sexual violence and crucially this happened in cities and on film. Unlike so much of the historical violence in Colombia which has taken place in the countryside and not recorded on, on film. The ongoing work of the Truth Commission in Colombia is collecting thousands of testimonies using people's memories and is in much and in contrast to the events of the last two weeks which have been as you many of you know shared so widely through whatsapp groups facebook twitter and so on so this is a very documented process and that's maybe the other key characterization of the short-term causes of what's happening which is that the leadership role being taken by young people and the use of social media in order to organize but also to disseminate so that means of course that whilst things happened without many people predicting them that same organi loose organizational structure driven by new media means that it's much less easy to bring them to an end because there's no one who can step in and say stop so those are the short-term causes then the medium and the long-term causes get a minute each the medium-term causes would be the slow, fragmented and sometimes incomplete implementation of the peace accords from 2016, which have been underfunded and undermined in some aspects by the government itself and other actors, most prominently, of course, the assassinations of community leaders uh, during the last few years. The Truth Commission is going to report in November at the end of this year, and of course it has a long a lot of work to to do then the other medium term cause is of course covid which has not only disrupted everybody's lives but also exacerbated inequality in colombia already one of the most unequal con countries in the continent and uh, pushed many more colombians into poverty so those are the medium term causes which you could argue um, without which events wouldn't have proceeded as they're as they are and then finally the long-term causes some of these are repeats are again the inequality um, secondly the ongoing weakness of the Colombian state and the fragmentation of its power across the territory again exacerbated by the demobilization of the FARC and then but the continued availability of weapons across the country some of which have been sold by the United Kingdom um, or facilitated by the United Kingdom government, arms licenses and so on. We can talk about that um, in a moment too. So we have a weak state combined with a lot of weapons and the strengthening of the militarization of some of the armed forces over the last decade or so. And then finally, the last long-term cause is the, what I guess we have to call a tradition of political violence or maybe a resignation to the use of violence for political ends. There are presidential elections next year and in many of the discourses that we see surrounding what's been going on over the next over the last two weeks we do see the circling of can, candid, candid, candidacies and potential um, running alliances and so on which can't I'm afraid be avoided that some of this is being manipulated for uh, political ends on, on all sides. So there you go, the short, 
the medium and the long-term causes in your five minutes. I will therefore hand over to Roddy for your two pens worth. Roddy. Thanks, Matthew. Um, and great that everybody's here. So in a way, I'll probably overlap a little bit with what you were saying, but I guess I'd start by saying that the violent catastrophic events happening now in Colombia are, of course, as you were mentioning, part of a longer term, what I would say is a permanent and embedded crisis within the Colombian state and society. And that's been characterized by a kind of pendulous swing between violent conflict, often civil war, historically speaking, and episodes of institutional stability that is essentially driven by the absolute closure of the economic and the political elites to permit even what is the most modest economic labor and political reforms that would effectively permit the distribution of power and resources out of the hands of that oligarchy, which is considerably small. And this has been, of course, exacerbated recently by Duque's unrelenting neoliberal policies and by the COVID pandemic, but it's historical in nature, right? Um, the immediate antecedent is also to add to what you were saying, the Paro Nacional in 2019, but the recent wave of protests also take place with, in what has been three years of attacks against the architecture of the peace agreements by the Duque government, the killing of social activists, as you said, former combatants, and in short, for me, it feels like the peace process kind of never really happened and the war continues. And in the wake of the peace agreements, much of society wants change, but the elites aren't letting go. In that regard, it reminds me very much of Central America. Um, so you have a highly, highly polarized society that's akin to living in a de facto apartheid along economic and political lines, where you have a kind of continuity of the past and sort of the permissibility of the use of violence. The protests, as you say, were sparked by a regressive tax form that kind of sought to shift the burden of what's an economic crisis that's been going on for ages and the budgetary shortfall from COVID upon those who, of course, can least afford it, whilst giving kind of benefits for large companies. They were aiming, to, I think, to raise about 6.3 billion by ultimately taxing the canasta basica and utilities around 19%. And of course, that's in the context is, as you mentioned, an acute COVID crisis, a poultry program of vaccination and testing, um, what, the third worst death rate, I believe, in Latin America, generally speaking. And of course, since 2019, you've seen a 7% rise in short around 3 million people, meaning that about 42.5% of Colombians live in poverty, around 63% are on the minimum wage, and those living in extreme poverty has also had an acute rise. And they're the ones that are most likely, of course, to die of COVID, right? Um, so the protests against the tax reform since rescinded, as you say, are both urban, but also increasingly rural as far as I've understood it. And they're significantly characterized, and this is what I wanna speak about now, is mass by massive police brutality. And I'd like to emphasize that point, right? The use of excessive force by the security forces, the police, particularly ESMAD, the infiltration of protests by the police. And that dynamic has largely been demos during the day, accompanied by or often followed by in the, in the nighttime police and state terror, including extrajudicial executions, disappearances, sexual violence, shooting at protesters' eyes, so using the kind of Chilean playbook, right? And repression and militarization have involved the use of sidearms, assault rifles, grenade launchers, all of which contravene international standards in policing. And I guess the point I want to make is this state terrorism has been a constant, hasn't it, throughout modern Colombian history. It's been wielded against civilians, non-combatants, armed groups alike, and the security forces have constantly been accused of human rights violations. And that state terror, and I think this is cyclical and certainly evidence is continuity has always been used to prevent challenges to kind of exclusionary political and economic model that effectively reigns in Colombia and has often used or signaled scapegoats trying to allow the oligarchy to exculpate itself and of course in the context of the Cold War that was somewhat easier they could blame the armed insurgencies but the narrative's getting old since at least the partial uh demobilization of the FARC or its remobilization afterwards but the government still blames the protests on leftist youths I've seen a lot of discourse on terrorist vandals subversives and so on 
And I think whilst the bill was withdrawn last week, which I think evidence is a really important achievement for the protesters, as does the whole of the purchase of F-16 fighters that was proposed by Duque. The protests are continuing because, as you rightly say there, about longer term demands, many of which were the root of Colombia's conflict, right? And so I think the end of the conflict with the FARC hasn't been accompanied by any means with by a shift in the mentality of the political and economic elites. In that regard, there's been no transition, right? The oligarchy continues to refuse to reform the exclusionary political and economic model. The protests, therefore, are probably unlikely to disappear or at least to evolve. And I think a further key point to think about closing is that the state, the government, the political, the, uh, the police and the military continue to wield a counterinsurgent vision against anyone that opposes them. And this is driven both by institutional inertia, but also by cognitive bias in the security forces. So they're still using the nat national security doctrine to treat anyone as the internal enemy, right? And as threats. And I think Colombia desperately needs a new civilian police force subject to oversight and accountability, not a counterinsurgency police force. The war hasn't ended then, I think, in that respect, because it's never been about defeating an insurgency. It's been more about upholding and preventing any challenge to the oligarchic system. And as you say, in the context of the elections, we need to demand government support the spirit, fulfill the commitments enshrined in and implement the peace agreements. And also think, as you say, uh, more widely about the question of addressing exclusion and inequality that was ultimately at the root of the conflict, right? And we need to stop saying that Colombia's economy and democracy is the most stable in the region. They're not, they never have been for anybody but the minority of Colombians. So that's where a lot of the stuff I've been reading in the BBC, right? Colombia is the most extraordinary economy. That mainstream um, discourse needs to be challenged. So that's more or less what I wanted to say. Thank you very much, Roddy. Fantastic. Really appreciate that. Going to hand over now to Lena. Lena, over to you. Thank you, Matthew. Well, as Roddy, Roddy and Matthew mentioned, the social discontent is not for now. Uh, the protests against the government uh, uh, began, as you know, in November 2019 in the framework of the Latin American protests in Chile, Ecuador, Peru, Bolivia, and the people, in particular the middle class, were demanding for the pending promises of social and economic rights and the fight uh, against corruption. Uh, at that time, uh, President Duque called the Great National Conversation in order to listen to citizen demands and different social actors. Um, this is something never happened. They had some meetings uh, with no results. And then the pandemic arrived, as my colleague mentioned, and then the conversation was cut short and the social crisis deepened. In this context, the president came out with his third tax reform over his presidency, charging more the work of the middle class and basic food and excluding products producing, produced by the companies which uh, financed, uh, financed uh, his political campaign. It exploded, as you know, and since then we have seen one of the most scandalous chapters of police repression, abuses, a massacre uh, broadcaster live on social media. Um, the government doesn't want or cannot read or both. Uh, this strikes as a social and legitimate movement demanding for a profound and necessary transformation in times of generalized dissatisfaction and demands of inclusion and recognition of hunger and lack of opportunities, in particular for the youngest. Uh, on the contrary, they, as Rodi mentioned as well, they still use the theory of the internal enemy, according to which protesters are not citizens in the exercise of the rights, but enemies of the state in the middle of a civil war uh, who must be eliminated. Uh, it has been dri uh, driven as well by the ex-president Uribe, invoking the use of arms against the protesters and promoting a Chilean neo-Nazi theory, which states that the social protests are a scheme of a terrorist plan uh, from the left wing who want to hand over the country. 
After the continuation and intensification of protests throughout the country, particularly in Cali, and the police brutality and attacks uh, by private security forces against civilians on the streets, the government has begun uh, conversations with different actors. Uh, the elite, his allies, uh, the courts, the coalition political parties of the center, and two days ago with the committee, the Comité Nacional del Paro. Uh, the meeting with his allies produced any change as an obvious consequence. The meetings with the center provoked more polarization. Uh, the last meeting uh, with the Comité Nacional del Paro was described by them, by them like uh, as a president's monologue, repeating empty words, basically a conversation without listening. Then my reflection today is about uh, the notion of dialogue. What a significant and con constructive dialogue means. In Colombia, we don't know about that. Uh, the government and the Congress don't understand the term and they confuse dialogue with long and empty conversations. Sometimes dialogue is a synonym of, of negotiations in which the government is waiting for what the people will give up how they can maintain their conventional ways of doing politics and protect the elite's economy, uh, economy, uh, elite's economic and political interests. Um, then um, the analysis is how to create a public, legitimate, reliable space for a dialogue. Uh, we need many hands on this. Uh, it's not an easy task. Uh, for instance, the international community <laughs> Needs, uh, uh, needs to put pressure on Duque and his allies. Uh, national, international academic, uh, uh, academics, uh, researchers, organizations, institutions who can facilitate a favorable uh, environment, starting with the always excluded, that in this case I'm mm, referring La Primera Línea in Cali, La Minga Indígena, the militarized communities in Chocó, the young people on the streets in Bogotá, Medellín, Pereira, and along, etc. An improbable dialogue is urgent, and we can help to build it. Uh, a group of academics are having, we're having a conversation with vice, vice chancellors in Colombia who offer their experience and universities uh, spaces for a public debate. And we hope together to build a proposal to make it happen. Uh, I will stop there. Uh, however, if, if, if you'd like to know about uh, this uh, proposal, we can just go further during the Q&A. Thanks, Matthew. Thanks, Lena. That's fantastic. And I can already see several comments in the chat relating to some of those questions. So I'm sure we will come back to those. But before we do open up to go through some of the questions in the chat and expand things a bit further, we'll hand over to Monica. Monica, over to you. Hi, everybody. Thank you, Matthew, for this invitation. I'm anthropologist and currently in Bogota. And as you know, we are having problems with internet, but internet and Twitter has been quite crucial in this movement to inform, to systematize, to report and to record the things that are happening on the streets and are not published by the, the let's say, the hegemonic media or the normal media here in Colombia. So sometimes we are having problems with internet in the last 15 days. I'm going to try to highlight some aspects uh, and I completely agree with the things that my colleagues have already mentioned and the analysis they are making but I could like as an anthropologist um, I would like to highlight some events and things that are happening during the last days mainly and uh, will help us to understand the complexity of the situation that we are facing in Colombia and the parallels and kind of similarities we are also seen in other protests during these last two years in Chile, in the United States as well, but also in the Salvador, because similarly we are experiencing a process of re-emergence of neo-fascist or empirical and in the practice um, a state of exceptions, no declared, undeclared state of exceptions. So I have written a piece because it's 
I have difficulties with my English sometimes, so I prefer to read if that's okay for you. On May 9, that is to say a couple of days ago, in the day 12 of the strike that start the 28th of April, and alive through social media, we saw how an armed group of men in civilian clothes went out from a white UCB Toyota and fired to the indigenous war of Cauca in Cali, the Minga. The balance was 10 indigenous people seriously injured, the men in civilian clothes, we don't know, paramilitaries, police in civilian clothes, civilians taking justice in their hands, disappeared. We don't know yet who were these people. The responses to this attack against the unarmed indigenous people from the government in television was, the indigenous must return to their resguardos. And from the hegemonic media was, there are confrontations between citizens and indigenous. The Santos peace process never end up its commitments to change the military doctrine of the armed forces. And this is important to mention. The national security doctrine inspired by the military doctrine that the United States expanded in Latin America during the 70s to contain communism creates the figure of the internal enemy. Consisted of communists, socialists, guerrilla, guerrillas or unionists. The military strategy consists in considering these subjects as a valid military target and therefore gives the armed forces green light to eliminate them. Alexis Lopez is a neo-Nazi ideologist from Chile and an admirer of the former dictator Augusto Pinochet, who seems to have been advising ex-president Álvaro Uribe and doing seminars and workshops for the armed forces in Colombia, spreading the theory of the dissipate molecular revolution, which is a postmodern concept from Deleuze and Guattari. The Chilean ideology's interpretation of the concept of Deleuze updates the notion of the internal enemy, identifying the protesting yacht, indigenous and social movements as the new target, the multitude in terms of Negri and Har. They are the internal enemy that has to be eliminated. Colombia has been dramatically affected by COVID-19. Inequality and poverty has increased and there has been a spike in violence. According to official figures, 42% of the population is now poor. And the unemployment has read, has, read has reached nearly 25%. The COVID-19 vaccination program has been very slow and only about 10% of the population has so far been vaccinated. The average COVID-19 death tolls is about 400 diseases per day and the number of new cases is reaching record levels. However, despite the virus, people have massively decided to protest against the government policies and the government, instead of listening to the people and finding alternatives, has responded with disdain and dispro dispro disproportionate violence. In the marches, there is a strong participation of Afro-Colombian people, indigenous, peasants, victims of the armed conflict, members of trained unions. In the cities and regions like Cali, Buenaventura, Pereira, Cúcuta, the demonstrations have been particularly intense and some of these places are now militarized. The fact that representatives of the indigenous groups have torn down statues of Spanish colonizers like Belalcázar and Juan e. Jiménez de Quesada have received criticism from the media. And in Manizales, students have torn down the statue of the Colombian fascist Gilberto Alzate Avendaño. In Pasto, the statue of Antonio Nariño, a white mestizo who was one of the liberators from Spanish colonialism who translate parts of the declarations of the human rights into Spanish, but who also is known to have massacred hundreds of indigenous people. So in the view of the above, there is a strong decolonial sensibility in the demonstrations. In the Colombian stride, we see a repeated gesture of a struggle and vindication man throwing down statues, symbols located in the central squares, places of political power where the representation of what is good and what must be done is projected by the state to the people. Similar action has been observed in South Africa with the students' movement Rhodes Must Fall, in Bristol with the fall of the statue of the slave trader Edward Colson, 
in Chile protests 2019 that begin as a response to the increase of the price of the subway ticket and end up with the referendum of the constitution of the dictator Pinochet. The Chilean, stu the Chilean students and indigenous organization threw down the status of Manuel Baquedano, Christopher Columbus, among others, conquerors and independent leaders who were cruel to the people and looted the nation's wealth. The main purpose of the intellectual movement and the social movement of decolonizing knowledge is exploring which forms of power and domination are, sustaining, uh, are sustained by the knowledge production. The coloniality has inspired us to reread our histories to hear the histories and the voices of the unseen and the people that it has been silenced. So we have to start to discover the, the heroic narratives and the figures that in a way underpin the state and the government were in fact also violent and looters. Students, indigenous, racialized and marginalized people. And I want to highlight this element because in the de facto or undeclared state of exception that we are experiencing in Colombia, the militarization has concentrated in the regions uh, located in the lowlands of Colombia mainly, in the areas that has been historically known by their critical capacity, by their social organizations, like in Cali, for example, the importance of the indigenous movement in Cauca, the importance of the reflexivity and critical political opinions of the people in Pasto. Um, so there is a sense of the elites from the center of Colombia in the highlands of Bogota controlling and trying to repress the massive heterogeneous expressions of the people that have, haven't been listened so far and included in the negotiations and in the process in Colombia. Monica, can I ask you to wrap up? Yes, sure. Uh, I just want to mention this element, which is crucial to understand this very rhizomatic and horizontal, because there is a, another important element that people do not want to be represented for, for politics as usual, for the same politicians, for the same leaders, but they are claiming a different kind of methodology and interaction with the state. And the state hasn't been able to understand that and on the contrary, have responds with more violence. So I just want to uh, stop here. And uh, I think it's important to, to, to think that these movements are claiming for new political imaginations and new methodologies to relate between citizens and the state. And uh, yeah. Thanks. Thanks very much, Monica. There are a lot of comments from what you've been saying already on the chat, so we'll have a chance to come back to those. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to read through some of the questions from the chat. Thanks ever so much for people who've been posting on them. And then I'll ask Lena, uh, uh, Roddy, Lena and Monica again to respond to whichever ones you choose. And then whichever ones are left over at the end, I'll answer. <laughs> um, so the first one is from Marta. Hi, Marta. Um, this is a question about um, why social media, and I'll add traditional media here in the UK, haven't really said anything about Colombia in the last two weeks. Some of my colleagues in the hospital have not any idea and create untruths about it. Also point to some situation about Venezuela. What's the real interest here? Then there's the question from Sandra Arbelaez. Hi, Sandra. Um, I totally agree with what Roddy is saying. I'd like to add that there are other short-term causes for the continuation of the protest. The proposed reforms to the health system, work and pensions, which would introduce a US-style health system, reduce even more the rights of workers and practically rob working people of their pensions. There are also other long-term causes, such as the underlying class and racial tensions that have been exacerbated by this government, which has violently repressed people from indigenous and black communities from the start, as well as putting a blind eye to the killings of human rights defenders from these communities. Then there's a question from our colleague Diego Acosta. Hi, Diego. Um, a question to the whole panel. Why do you consider that the epicenter of the protests has been Cali? And what is the role of the systemic racisms in these protests? Then there is the question from Diana in Exeter. Hi, Diana. 
Um, I was wondering if this unrest can be traced back not just to the 21st of November 2019, but even before maybe the 2013 Great Agrarian Strike or before the many dialogues that were held in 2014, promises have not been fulfilled. Many were integrated into the peace agreement, which has not been fulfilled either. So we may be talking of accumulated discontent of years of promises and dialogues broken. Roddy made another good point worth its own analysis, the special military character of the police in Colombia, which makes unclear who coordinates and gives orders. So the bad apples narrative has been kept for years as well. Then there's a question there from Sandra, which I've also received separately on the WhatsApp group of people, which has been set up to coordinate events in Bristol. And I'll, um, somebody will confirm to me on the chat later on, but I believe the next meeting of that is for Sunday, 3 p.m., on College Green in the centre of Bristol, for those of you who are here, um, which is how can we pressure the UK and other governments um, to take action and condemn Colombia's state violence? I've written to my MP, but I feel that's not enough. Maybe Roddy, Lena, Monica, you want to come in on that? Um, yeah. Then um, I also have another question from Liliana Arango. Um, part of that group, is there any effective action from the international organizations versus the Colombian government for the human rights violations which have been committed? Um, definitely, I know our panelists can come in on that. Then there's a question from somebody, what are your thoughts on the UK government training the Colombian police? We can come to that. Um, yep, I said Diana's one. Uh, then Nick Morgan. Hi, Nick. Um, very difficult to capture such a complex phenomenon in such short interventions. Tell me about it. Um, the Cumbre Agraria, I go a step further. In the ecology of social movements, the agrarian, rural, collectively titled movements have been much more dynamic, but this might lead to far greater organization in the cities, creating a real urban movement not captured by political parties. It smacks of the Caracaso to me. Super. Thanks for that. Then a question from Adriana Suarez. Hi, Adriana. What role do the failed peace agreements, can you give specific examples? I'm thinking about, oh, what role do the failed peace agreements, can you give specific examples, uh, have? I'm thinking about failed programs to eradicate illicit crop, crops in the Amazon, playing these dissatisfactions. And do you see differences between what is going on in rural areas and what is happening in urban centers? Do rural and urban areas come together in these demands or are these more urban demonstrations? Thank you. And um, there's another question secretly about how can you join the WhatsApp group about uh, the Bristol, um, what are, what's we calling it? Um, coming together links, convergences. And um, if you send me an email to matthew.brown at bristol.ac.uk, I'll send you the link to it. That's probably enough questions to be getting on with, do you think? Roddy, over to you, you can answer. Um, and look, we've got 12 minutes before we're gonna wrap up because this is a short, uh, we're not gonna have enough time to do it all justice. We'll let, should we do it again? I think we probably should. Um, okay, so Roddy, you've probably got four minutes to answer all those questions. Yeah, no, thank you. Brilliant questions and we need a longer discussion. Absolutely right, let's do, do it again and have follow up. I think that's part of the problem is that there are all of these kind of disparate very interesting and very good um, meetings, but we need kind of articulation between them and follow up. So that's a great idea. Um, just really briefly, just probably on the things that I can answer. So usually, so Diana's question, usually in peace processes, there's a clear commitment to reform the police or particularly police that have been historically repressive, as is the case in Colombia, of course, uh, reform the mandate of the armed forces, um, kind of purification, deparation processes, right? To make sure that those accused of human rights violations aren't participating still in them, in the mili military um, and to seek accountability for them. In the case of Guatemala and El Salvador, that was really important, right? There was a pro the proposal for a new Policia Nacional Civil in both countries were formed. They've had their own problems, absolutely. But in a sense that, was predicated on the agreement of the negotiating parties that the police forces had played a problematic role as a repressive state apparatus. It's not been the case in Colombia. As far as I know, you know, that commitment wasn't made in the peace agreements in terms of the police forces. And as Monica said and Lena said, and you said as yourself, Matthew, you know, the problem is what you have 
is the existence of a militarized police that continues in Colombia that hasn't been forced institutionally to align itself with some of the key spirit of the peace agreement and therefore it's it's kind of still existing it's still there and it allows as, as diana says this kind of bad apple question to be maintained when it isn't a bad apple question it's the fact that the military doctrine is that the police doctrine is based upon a militarized national security doctrine and it's systemic and it's systematic right so i think in terms of lobbying thinking about how that might move forward there's always been lobbying around the police force obviously but there and I saw, maybe I was wrong, but the SMAD, the US support to the SMAD has been temporarily stopped. Is that correct? Um, there seems, that seems to me to be a really important line linking to the issue of, you know, police training. Police, what, police training, given what the police has been doing in the UK recently, police training, any, any other national police force on human security, on human rights doctrine is in itself highly problematic. But I think that will be a focus we used to do the same back in the 90s when I was involved in solidarity work on Central America. One of the key questions was police training in, in, in Central America. It's a, it's a concrete kind of easy thing to get hold of and to lobby MPs on. Um, and in terms, finally, of the peace agreements. Yeah, I mean, I think you mentioned them there anyway. Um, Adriana. So, yeah, I mean, I think failed rural development that I believe is kind of the one that's been least implemented question of substitution of illicit crops and so forth it's it's a wider context where there's there seems to be absolutely no will whatsoever to take on board any of the key spirit and Im implement any of the key agreements of the peace of the peace process sorry thanks very much Roddy. no perfect perfect lena okay i will refer to to two points one is why kali uh, that's really interesting. Uh, I think it's two particular things. Uh, one is, a, is about Cali has very important, solid indigenous communities that have had an important, all of them around Colombia, but I mean there they have a really important Minga uh, that have been working on just all these issues uh, for years, and I think that's one of the key issues. They are really important, very solid, but and, and a big population, I mean, in terms of uh, balance of numbers, uh, they, are, they are important there. That's one of the things. The second one, and, and probably is quite interesting, is the direct impact of the drug trafficking on that city. Uh, Cali lives and uh, its economy is maintained for years and decades based on the drug trafficking. Then these barriers in which they had the most uh, the, the most important presence, people living there with enormous and very expensive houses, everything, the economy is around this. Um, and they, they were who, who were defending against the, the Minga and against the Guardia Indígena. And definitely this is, this is the moment in which uh, we can see clearly the contention that they had during the years between the social, uh, the civil society organizations demanding for opening the, the, the agenda, the public sphere, and at the other side, how governments at no, a local and national level had been living with the drug traffickers and actually taking advantage of the, of the business at all levels, at national level, at local level, that definitely is, this is an, uh, a social bomb there, and a social important uh, uh, thing that is there um, in particular. Um, then definitely we will know more uh, in the next uh, uh, probably days uh, about what's going on there. But definitely is something that is a uh, many people asking for changes from there and this uh, uh, lack of uh, or the, the exclusion that many are in, in Cali in particular with this uh, situation. The second one is about the UK government and the actions uh, related to them. And I have to say that the UK hasn't had a great interest in Colombia in general, as you mentioned, uh, then it's not new for now. I know that at least the Guardian habilitated a, a WhatsApp for receiving 
some of this uh, news from Cali, uh, from the protests in general. Uh, however, that is absolutely true. It's difficult, it's difficult to create this interest uh, and it's not a uh, natural in the, in the, in the international agenda. Uh, However, I think that's that's the thing that we can do now, and is try to propose uh, uh, this um, this dialogue, this substantial dialogue, and I hope we can um, we can do more with strategic actors, uh, and definitely uh, we will uh, publish to all of you how to join and how to support the idea uh, that are coming from Colombia in this in this sense. Thanks very much, Lena. Perfect. Wonderful. Um, Monica. I'm going to be very short. Thank you so much for the questions. Um, I'm going to refer to two questions, the question about Cali and the question about uh, the Constitution. I think it's important. The question about Cali, also Cali is well known for its labor movement. Cali has neighborhoods with the name of El Barrio Obrero, for example, and that's the reason why the people gather in these neighborhoods. So there is a strong history of social and unions, trade unions in Cali, because Cali used to be one of the industrial cities of Colombia. Another reason is the geopolitical location of Cali. Cali is in between the ocean and in between the Interandian valleys. And the Interandian valleys of Colombia are the areas where coca cocaine production and cocaine cultivation has been concentrated during the last two years after the peace agreement. It was a new phenomenon and the mafias are controlling the Interandian valleys. If you see the map on the Interandian valleys of Colombia from Catatumbo to the valley, you see all the, the, the massacres and operations have been concentrated in them, even though the state hasn't intervened them. So they are more or less controlled by the mafias. So the people is tired of being controlled by the mafias and the people it's tired of being excluded from central politics and ignored by the government. So that's the reason that Cauca, Chocó, eh, Nariño, and this area of Colombia has been like kind of gestated in the social explosion that we are seeing now. That's one thing. And last time I was in a conversation, and there are a lot of people in the media saying that precisely what we are having in, Mo in Colombia is a kind of pre-revolutionary moment and so forth. And my opinion is quite different. Instead of seeing a revolutionary moment, which is the people, in fact, associate to the use of guns, what we see is a peaceful moment. And I could say we, we have a pre a moment or a pre-national constitution assembly moment, which was with that never happened during the peace agreements with FARC. What we were expecting after the peace agreement with FARC was calling to a national assembly to include the people from the regions, from the different collectives that weren't heard in the, in the peace process in Havana because it took place in another place very far from Colombia so the people could not reach these conversations. That's what we were expecting. So what we see is a pre momento pre asamblea nacional constituyente where the people is climbing new methodologies, where the people is climbing to be listened and is climbing also to have a new relation with the state and not only following um, a, a, a proposal from the government. Uh, there is a new element now. Uh, Uribe is making some concessions. We have to make clear that now the tax reform is not taking place. It has been derogated. And also the health reform has been derogated. And now Uribe is saying, because in fact, Uribe is who is governing the country via Twitter, he is making a concession with the Jot and with the young people, uh, saying that during the next semester, that we have free uh, fees for entering universities for the people in Estratos, because we are organizing Colombia in different strata, for those, the poorest one, two, and three. And now we also at the same time in the amid of these demonstrations, the government decides to start or reinitiate dialogues with the guerrilla LN. He has been in Cuba. So this is a new scenario right now. Um, what we interpret from what is happening now is that they want to create some small kind of concessions to reduce the volume of the demonstrations. But by bringing the negotiations with the LN, I think that something new is, is, is in process of configurating 
that could be a new form of stigmatizing the social movement. So we prefer to separate the negotiations with Ellen with this peaceful and different social movement. Um, yeah, maybe you have more questions about it in the future. Yeah, I think that's probably one that we're going to have to uh, come further to because as we can see from the chat developing down the side of the screen, we're going in lots of different directions and there's um, certainly we can agree that not all of us are agreed on everything and that definitely, as Roddy said before, the definitely uh, motivation for more of these kind of events and hopefully, who knows, um, one day soon in person in a lecture theatre in, in the University of Bristol where people can talk to one another afterwards rather than me just pressing end meeting and that's gone. Um, our time together is up. I would like to thank all of you for coming and participating in such a respectful manner. Um, it's been absolutely exemplary. I'd like to thank Roddy and Lena and Monica for their excellent thoughts and presentations. I'll send you an email when we pop it onto YouTube and we can continue this discussion on the comments section on YouTube. How's that for a different scenario for academic discussion? Um, thanks ever so much, everybody. Take care, stay safe, and un gran abrazo. Ciao.